that uh, creates things that don't change a stagnant society, and that's where you see fall of empires. So I'm going to pick on the easy target on this one. That, this seems like a topic very relevant for werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what you're trying to say here is that um, it's difficult, okay? Because you, you, like, for cultural, if you go back and you go, okay, every period in time from Victorian to the Dark Ages to Regency to modern times, everything has always had you know, cultural constraints put on them. This is taboo, this is whatever. I think when you have um, stories where a, a, a society has restraints on things, well, I think that and given to you as an author creates a lot of conflict that you can use to build a really powerful story because breaking free of those constraints is what really makes a book it makes things interesting, makes people involved, it, it, because they all they want to break free of their own constraints in their own life. So if they're reading someone who breaks through the the constraints of a society, even if it is involved in magic or whatever, uh, it 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 brings light, it brings a difference, and conflict and change, which always betters everyone's life around. You know, mm -hmm. so. To me, I, I wouldn't let something like that stop me from writing something. I would use that as a, a tool to make the story better than it was going to be to begin with. Does that come close to answering what your question so what, is? I think, yeah. Okay, because I wasn't sure quite what the question was. I, I've heard um, a variant of this question asked before, and an answer that I've heard um, also suggests that um, Having other people sort of look at the assumptions that you've baked into your world um, can make a big difference, and having a diversity of eyes and viewpoints on that question can lead to a lot of cracks that you may be able to blow open. So, for example, um, if you if you uh, an example of places where there can be blind spots on this may be you know some of the easy ones to think of are like race, gender, nationality, that sort of thing, right? But also just what are the um, what are the religious Thing, what, what are religious taboos that are baked into sort of your view of how the society would, would view itself? What are the questions that society cares about that its neighbor may not? And how does that affect? This all goes into what Sanderson calls the third law, which is expand and don't add. Um, when he says that, he means don't just look at the question of what can I do with my power, but how would this magic system affect the society that it's baked into? If I have the ability to just snap my fingers and create fire, well, what does that mean for the barbecue recipes? Um, what does that mean for, you know, just think, just weird stuff like that. Like, if you just do stuff like that at random, then what, what does that change? Like, for us, it's just sort of an assumption of how the world works. There are all sorts of cracks that you can kick open with those questions, but you have to look at them from different areas to, to look at them. When you're looking at that, look at something allegorical. In, in terms of when somebody's reading the story, oh, this is just ice in the water. But by the time they get to the end of the story, it needs something a whole lot deeper. Uh, okay, yes. The painted one has waited a long time. <laughs> yeah, I had a question. Um, this is more for the hard part of magic. Um, but what, do you, what is your revision process like if you do find out that something's broken or you want to change something throughout the book? Do you work backward from the effects that you want to achieve in the scenes? Do you work forward so that you know how your characters are going to, uh, how your characters are going to use the magic? How do you do those sort of things? Is this before you publish something or after? <laughs> 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 That's what I was going to say. Wow. Like, in my first series, I was forced into doing the whole forward thing because the first book came out and I had this rule um, that if you touched the throne you couldn't leave the city and it's a first person narrative and then in book three I needed them I needed the main character to leave the city <laughs> and I'm like oh shit <laughs> I said explicitly in book one you know I could pick the sentence out the person cannot leave the city. So I couldn't go back and break that. Um, and so it actually became a, a challenge for myself to figure out how can I use the rules that I've already established 
in order to solve this problem. And in my opinion, the way I got around it was, um, I think it enriched the magic system. It made the magic system a lot more interesting in the long run, um, working forward. Um, so sometimes you're trapped into working <laughs> forward just based on what's been published. Um, if there's nothing set in stone, you haven't been published yet um, with that, then, then I think almost everybody works backwards. You, you work through the story and then, it, like I said earlier, the revisions mean everything because you can make everything work when you revise the book. So, uh, so given the choice, I would work backwards. But every now and then you got to work forwards. <laughs> um, I, I really like to make them into plot points. Yeah. So if, if there's somewhere where I really, really accidentally did something, it's, it's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm not going to give any examples, but uh, there, there, are, there are points where I, I, would, I put something out and publish it, and they would, I would almost immediately get, hey, you said earlier that you can't do this. And then we start the next book on a certain scene where we're explaining how we were able to do that. Yep. <laughs> and it's a very big plot point and it's very, you know, new way, new directions for the book to go. And I find it insanely painful. Like I swear yes. so hard. Because it's like if you're off by like by like five points and you've mentioned it fifty times in the story and like you've literally wrote the numbers down, you have to rework that. And then there were other like decisions you made. Like I, I swear like a sailor. Um, but then also like there was a book where uh, my character had was like trapped in the ground and he had to drink the eye fluid of like these nasty creatures oh. and then one of my fans was like yeah like in the earlier book he found a hood that sees in the ground ah, damn. Uh, so I actually had the characters make fun of him for that and like he got really mad and like got drunk and slapped one of them um, so I mean that was a learning process for me as an author hopefully that never happens again um, but there is another secret to this too which is um, Brandon, uh, Brandon Sanderson is not one person, despite what uh, you would do to believe. Uh, there is actually Team Sanderson, and um, when when you become big and awesome like Brandon is, you get to have people who go through and serve as continuity editors before you publish your next volume. Uh, if if you want to talk about spreadsheets, um, uh, Brandon, one of Brandon's assistants has a uh, a live tracker that tracks where um, large storms are on the planet by day by GPS coordinate and Brandon gets it wrong all the time <laughs> and he'll he'll write a scene where there's a, where the Everstorm has hit such and such a city and Karen calls him up and says Brandon why did you do this you know good and darn well the Everstorm is actually 50 miles to the east <laughs> and he has to make a revision but because he's Brandon Sanderson nobody knows about this because, it, because this goes through lots and lots and lots of checking before it makes it out for publication uh, not everyone has such ample resources, and so they have to get a little more creative. So I like using loopholes. I, I don't know if it's just the way I think, but I always tend to find a loophole somewhere, some way. And I think that's also really good for helping develop your characters, too, because like talking about smart magic versus dumb magic, okay, your smart person's going to find a way around the boulder instead of you know just giving up or going home. Uh, next, Tom. Uh, that's why I'm not called on that person, because they're out of field of view. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Sorry, out of person on Tatooine. What's your question? <laughs> so, we hear you repeatedly talk about magic having a cost. You input things like one that one, one willpower, one direction, one focus makes one fireball. How do you try to separate out the mechanical necessity of magic as a formula? input x output y from the sort of mystical i can do this supernatural thing that's really special and cool for your characters um, who, who wants to take that one okay, me personally like yeah. uh the the characters in my in my books get skills um but i wanted to base it on real life so like let's say that you know he and I both like you know study the piano for five years. Uh, maybe he has the talent to be Mozart, and I'm still playing chopsticks no matter how hard you practice. Um, so like it's an affinity system. Um, but yeah, just because one person does the, I mean I think that's one of the points of magic. Just because one person can do it, and another person can't. They do go through the same thing. Science is no matter where we are in the world, we do the same thing. We're gonna get the same result. 
Um, so I think it's inherently built into the quote unquote magic. One thing that you can mess around with is, you know, pers including personality traits into the magic too, right. right? Not just your aptitudes, but also your attitudes, and how how does that factor into how you know your personal flavor, how you weave the magic or whatever, yeah. can have an impact too, right? Uh, Tom, so we have four minutes left, so we're going to try to do lightning round on this. So let's do <laughs> let's do a question and then an answer from one person on the panel. How about we do that? Okay. Uh, when RPG. Um, everybody that's played a game knows that there are sometimes things that don't work in mechanics that do happen in the story and vice versa. How do you balance that and how do you make it feel like it would be fun? Okay. Um, one of the things that I was trying to write was something that was realistic, so sometimes it just doesn't work. Uh, I love the idea that like he learns some spell and he's doing it, he's casting it, and it's about to happen, and just goes, Psh! and somebody's like, yeah, I'm having a hard time doing it. He's like, give me a minute, man, I can do this. Um, so you can be realistic, and one of the great things is consequences for your characters when it doesn't match up. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Tom? So I wanted to know, <clears throat> whether it be your favorite or your first, what your primary inspiration for your magic system was, which is kind of going to be an everyone thing. First one to answer. All right, let's do uh, let's do one word answers yes. starting with LH. BBC's Merlin. Oh wow. Okay. Dakota. Appreciate that. D and D five D. Sorry. Three point five. Three point five. Math. Uh, I mean, honestly, uh, Mozart. Wow. 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 Uh, that's why I gave that example. I mean, that's an amazing answer. That's awesome. All right. Um, I don't really care who answers this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's uh, do you ever write a magic system where um, the magic really interacts with the uh, character and their humanity or even their sanity? And if you do, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, who's, uh, who's, uh, me? Oh, yeah. I, I um, well, I go back to the. Uh, the the character who every time he used magic it like basically physically affected him and he became darker and darker and in that particular world if he went too far um, he would actually separate into two different creatures essentially um, so uh, so so yeah that's how that's how I had him interact with the magic because he had to start figuring out how to balance how much magic he used for what he needed to use it for and without basically tearing himself apart at the same time, so. I'm going to invoke rule zero and uh, override myself and let Dakota also answer the question. Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I have a, a, a part in my book where uh, the, the character can get a skill. And the skill is something, it's called uh, mental manipulation resistance, right? So it, it does all these great effects, but it also makes you retain some of the memories of dying when you are dying in the game, right? So like instead of just respawn and you're back later, hours later, like, oh, it's Sunday night, what happened? Um, you know, it's, you're starting to remember and that's not something the human mind is built for. So it's a skill he does not want to increase, but he can't help but increase it as certain things happen. Okay, Tom. Um, it, we're all kind of nodding our heads along here. Is there a dissenting opinion on the panel that says, like, now don't follow the laws or anything like that? <laughs> which, which of the laws is the most crap? Go. <laughs> zero. 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 Err on the side of lame. <laughs> Actually, as I said, they're all pretty uh, good tenets of good writing. And um, the, even people that don't write magic use these elements in their stories, whether they know it or not. So I, I just, I, I was pretty impressed. I would say that I wouldn't disagree with any of them, but I would say that there was one that I felt like was missing, and is that um, power should be get greater danger and greater peril, right? So there's the old yes. trope of you break into a crypt and you get a sword, but it lets the evil out, or whatever you're going to do. Basically, it keeps the story fresh and move along. Okay. And this will be the last question here. I'm sorry for everybody else. So you all have talked a lot about hard magic, but we haven't talked much about soft magic. Um, where is the value, and how do you balance a system like that? The value of soft magic? Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll make a preliminary statement and let the panel um, correct me on it. I think if you want a world like Tolkien's, Tolkien's the quintessential soft magic. 
where you know the magic is there, but the characters don't really understand how to interact with it. The hobbits do not know what's going on. <laughs> um, and Frodo just sort of suffers from it. He knows the rule that matters, which is don't put this damn thing on. <laughs> right? And, and there is a real cost to his sanity uh, for using that magic, but he doesn't know how it works. Nobody knows how it works. And when Gandalf shows up and he breaks the bridge in front of the Balrog, nobody knows what Balrog is. They, nobody, nobody knows it's an angel. Nobody knows it's a fallen angel. This is all just weird stuff that's in the background. Um, that's the, but, but everybody cites Middle Earth as a realm that has just full of this sense of wonder. And you, you just sort of get lost in it. You just imagine it for years and years because your brain just sort of fills in what's missing, right? Because it doesn't matter for the story. And that's where you can get a lot of that value. I'm very interested for the panel to correct me on that statement. Nope. Um, I actually agree. I, I like a combination of hard magic and soft magic because for me, I mean, as, as, I, as I'm a reader, I like to have certain defined rules, but I like to be able to, in my mind, say, oh my gosh, but there's this. Is that really important? Like it's in the background. It's not talked about, but it's there. I feel like it helps build your world and your characters and just everything overall. And it kind of lets your imagination as a reader um, run wild um, and kind of like imagine like your own kind of fun little take on it. Oh, the what ifs. And oh, maybe the author will come up with this coming. I do it all the time. Tamara appears. Hmm. All the time. <laughs> Narnia is another example of this too. The more soft magic you use, the more allegorical you can get with it. Um, that's a, I mean, I was there when the deeper magic was written, right? Um, well, it's deeper than deep. Okay, well, I guess something crazy is about to go down. <laughs> I, I would say the soft magic is, is more useful when the magic itself isn't necessary, isn't necessary for the actual story. Um, and I think that goes back to the basis of the panel, which was that the payoff for your story, if you're writing an actual fantasy magical system, the payoff is tied to the rules and how well your reader understands the rules. So if you lay out all these rules, then whatever the ending is for your story, had damn well better rely on those rules and play with those rules in a meaningful way. Whereas if you use soft magic, you don't need that. Uh, the payoff of, of the story isn't about the rules and the magic. The payoff of the story is something else entirely, um, like you know, Frodo tossing the uh, or well, trying to trying to toss the ring into the volcano and whatnot. Uh, uh, that doesn't really technically have anything to do with the magic itself, right? His goal is just to de to destroy the ring, and that's it. There's no magic involved there, so it doesn't rely on the rules, and. That's why there's no rules, because you didn't need that for the payoff of that particular story. Soft magic is the world, hard magic is your weapon. And I'd say that soft magic, nice. yeah, I like that soft magic could also be great by hinting at things, right? Like in the Mistborn, like you understand the hardness of the protagonist, but you have no idea the, the, what, the powers behind you know, the antagonist, right? And it is something at the end, but he sort of drops little snippets that you're trying to figure out, and it makes it really exciting for the reader. Um, to have a big reveal at the end that you didn't do that. Okay. Uh, that technically is the end of our panel. We are out of time. Um, if you uh, will, please give feedback in the app. Uh, feedback in the app is read and it is digested and it is beloved. Please give it. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all of our panelists. You guys are doing fantastic. <laughs> for a few minutes of DVD extras to the extent that the panelists are willing to chat and uh, pitch their book, or uh, uh, haul their book. So, uh, nobody would ever do that. Nobody would be so gauche as to 11 o'clock at night. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. I have some free free